Uh, hi, you're joining the Free and Equal Network today. Uh, we're here online with two lovely doctors uh, from Britain uh, of the Qualitative Election Study of Britain. And uh, we have Dr. Ezia Carvalho and Dr. Christy Winters. Welcome to the Free and Equal Network today. Hi, thanks so much for having us on. Uh, the pleasure is all mine. And I want to really um, thank you so much for taking your time early in the morning here in America and Britain. It's this whole world. We're all really one. It's really a small world, I say, and big galaxy. So um, what a pleasure to have uh, both of you. Uh, you really specialize in a topic that I uh, take to heart. You know, here at Freeney Collections, I'm the founder of, we've been around seven years now. I feel kind of hopefully too young for that, but we've been around seven years. And we're about creating open and transparent elections through education. And uh, I'm, I'm sure you ladies are aware of the 2012 open presidential debate we held, moderated by broadcast legend Larry King and myself. And that was a really um, pivotal time for free and equal elections. I've had a background for 15 years in helping get really accountable candidates on the ballot, uh, helping circulate, gather, defend over a million signatures and successfully getting even independent Democrat, Republicans, third parties, independent candidates on the ballot. Yeah. And so in 2008, free and equal elections started when we hosted our first debate um, that was nationally televised alternative to the Commission on Presidential Debates. And we'll go in a little bit more about the Commission on Presidential Debates, um, which doesn't necessarily do a, a great thing for our country, I feel. But um, in any case, I want to express my gratitude for participating uh, in this uh, really thought-provoking discussion. And so I wanted to introduce you. Um, Ed, Edzia, I want to, uh, Dr. Edzia Carvalho, I'll call you Edzia during the interview. Um, just curious if we could get a little bit of a short synopsis and a background of how you became passionate in your field and studies, uh, really with the qualitative um, election study of Britain. And it sounds like you really want to open the debates as well, <laughs> but curious to hear a little bit of your background briefly. Um, thank you. Um, I must just say, on behalf of Christy as well, thank you for having us. Uh, we are really excited to speak to you as well. Uh, in terms of my background, I started off actually as a human rights um, academic. So my uh, my work is essentially on human rights. But in 2010, um, Christy roped me in and do her work on British elections. And um, till 2010, neither Christy nor I had seen any qualitative election research on Britain that was being done. And Christy had the uh, brilliant idea of why can't we apply qualitative methods to understand the election. And so she applied for uh, a grant, was successful, and then ran a pilot project on the qualitative election study of Britain and did really, really well on that. And that kind of got me going because the idea of why people vote the way they do was the thing that really got my interest. Um, and it gone on from there. Because I see um, my own country, so I come from India, and I can't understand why people vote the way they do. And so trying to understand what people do in the UK is a way for me to try and understand what's happening in India as well. The connections are actually quite uh, worldwide in a sense. You know, try and understand um, what's going on in people's minds. Um, how do they make up their minds? What are the factors that affect them? Essentially, the same everywhere to try and understand that. That's how. That's where. That's where I come from. Yeah. Well, thank you. I I have um I have to just admit I almost have like a little bit of, of watery tears because I'm so excited that there's other people out there that are so passionate about um, really bringing about accountability within our elections. I feel will help resolve or. Um, um, inevitably resolve pretty much everything, the problems we have throughout the world. It seems very obvious. So thank you for being here today. And Christy, Dr. Christy Winters, I'm going to call you Christy from here on. Please say hi and introduce yourself as well. <laughs> yeah, so hi, I'm uh, yes, Christy and I'm an American. So it's a little bit strange, you know, Edzia comes from India, I come from the US. We met during our PhDs in the UK. She's now uh, based at the, at the University of Dundee in Scotland and I'm based in Cologne, Germany. But we keep working on British, you know, elections despite you with our, our diverse backgrounds. Um, I started off actually, I, I'm very on the, sort of the left side of the political spectrum uh, for the US. 
Um, and I was in democratic politics growing up. I sort of worked in uh, a legislative office in Wisconsin. I worked for the Democratic Party and did some advanced work for uh, in Hillary Clinton and Al Gore at the time back in the 90s. So I'm getting, uh, dating myself here in terms of she wasn't even a candidate back when I was doing stuff for her. And I left politics eventually because there was a lot of shifting, political jobs come and go, as you know. But one thing I knew that um, from my time in the legislature was that political elites, as you call them in political studies, pretty easy to figure out. Politicians want money so that they can get power, and they use power to get more money so that they can stay in power. I and mean, that's basically, I think, you know, an easy way to understand the political system. But voters are way more complicated, and the small decisions voters make add up to who ends up running the country. And so I had trained as a quantitative, a survey-based political scientist, but I saw a real gap in the kind of focus group that work that was being done in the U.S. Now, there, and some, increasingly in the U.K. too, it's getting more press attention. But there wasn't academically designed, rigorous sort of standards to qualitative research that there was for the survey-based methods. And so, yeah, the postdoc was in part, uh, part of it was doing the qualitative election study of Britain in 2010, which was also the first year that Britain had systems of televised debates across the country. So I think there was one instance where some people had debated, but in the UK they don't have the tradition like we do in the US going back to the 60s of having regular debates and expecting that candidates are going to show up and defend their policies and their party. And so that was the same year that I was doing the study. So understanding the debates became then part of the qualitative election study of Britain, and then we carried it forward. So yeah, that's kind of a little bit about me, but also a little bit about how the study you know, kind of came into being and how it relates to the debate question. Oh. Uh, well, um, geez, you both sound like a perfect fit for our, our advisory board at Free and Equal Elections, just throwing that idea out there. Um, but uh, we'll follow up with you on that for sure. And but in any case, um, thank you, ladies, again. And I would love to just dive right into to you, um, whoever would like to respond. Um, what is the Qualitative Election Study of Britain? Where can people find this online in case they're watching right now and they want to look it up while watching the rest of the interview? Could you give us a synopsis of, of what that's about and how you're funded as well, which seems really beautiful. <laughs> I'll take that one if that's okay, let's see. Um, yeah, so uh, the Qualitative Election Study of Britain, you can find it. It's, it was my project blog after 2010, and we are in the process of getting a website to migrate it to. But currently, you can just type in Winters Research, my last name, research, dot wordpress, I think it's dot org, or if you just do um, Qualitative Election Study of Britain you'll get a lot of hits, and there's a, we have a website that has all of our videos, and it has even our, our funding application. So you can see what we proposed to the British Academy, Leverhulme Small Grant Trust, that's who's very generously funded this research, and what our promised outputs are and our methodology, um, and then we have our vlog where we are putting up we put up our um, field research notes when we were in the field, and then when we have publications, those are also on there that you can link to. Um, we've got an open access journal and another article that was published that you can still access uh, the journal Parliamentary Affairs. Um, and let's see, yeah, so what we do is it's, it's a pretty simple idea. We just uh, ask people questions and listen to their answers, and we ask people questions about the election and the campaign and the role of democracy and their satisfaction with the democratic process. And then we listen to see what they have to say. And in this case, we did, was it Edzia, 23 total focus okay. groups in about six weeks in England, Scotland, and Wales with almost 100 people, which was a massive amount of data gathering. We calculated it out and um, we did uh, 4,500 kilometers well, I did at least because I had to travel a little bit farther um, in six weeks, just traveling all over the UK doing these uh, focus groups that were anywhere from four to ten people. They lasted 60 minutes in length and covered a, a number of discussions. And then in particular to study the debates, we had focus groups on the nights of the debates for each of the formats that they had in the UK for this last election. We talked to people before the debates, then they watched them, and then before there was any media coverage, we turned it all off, and then we talked about their reactions to it and their thoughts and, and uh, how they perceived it. So that was kind of, yeah, basically the study and where you can find us and the kinds of things that we're interested in examining. So everybody go to the bottom of this YouTube. We're going to post a link there. It's uh, Winters 
uh, as it sounds, W-I-N-T-R-S, research.wordpress.com. And you'll, um, the videos, there's a lot of them there, but the impression of the debates video uh, will really help you to get a better understanding of what these ladies are all about. So if you want to pause the video and hear and watch that come back, um, probably a pretty cool idea so we don't spoil a lot of stuff for you. But, um, so yeah, rolling right into um, our next um, questions here. I have so many um, probably going to want to figure out, like, doing the study with 100 people you mentioned um, from England, Scotland, Wales, uh, what did you set out, like, what did you discover and what hypothesis did you set out to challenge, um, if, you, if you would like? And also, like, what were the most powerful or conclusive results as well? Um, I wasn't surprised by a lot of them. It was just nice to hear it, you know, like somebody gets it. This is why the debates are so crucial. So I might jump into this discussion as well. <laughs> so I don't know, you're, I'm going to add, I defer to Etsy on this one, but just to be clear, you want to know our findings on the debates. Is that, because we have um, a lot of that, findings. That's <laughs> correct. Um, I should have clarified that. So um, I would say on the debates would be um, a, a super thing. And then if you want to give an overall of other things you do as well, please go ahead and do that too. I also don't want to interrupt, but I also, Edzi, I might want to just describe the debates in 2010 and then the debates in 2015 very briefly to give uh, non-UK based members of the viewing audience an idea of what it is because it's a very different situation than in the US. So to understand some of the findings, it could probably help if Edzi just sets up some of that background to our Please, it's conversation here and so feel free to fill us in on the gaps and and kind of we can roll into what the what your work has um, uh, revealed. So please go ahead, Asia. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thanks for Christine. Thanks for that reminder. Um, I'll start with our question for the overall um, project, the political election study of Britain in 2015. I think based on our findings and our, our research from the 2010 project, what we were really interested in is the marginality of seats. So there are some seats in the UK where the um, outcome is the foregone conclusion and they are called safe seats. This is because the difference uh, or the, the margin of the victory is so huge um, that pundits and voters and the political establishment don't actually consider that these seats are going to be lost by the incumbent. And so it's almost a waste. Um, at least from the point of view of many voters that we spoke to, of even voting in that election. And, and there are other seats where they are marginal, where the, the margin of victory is so small that they can switch to any, um, any person or any party. And so then those seats are in play. And what we wanted to find out was how voters perceive um, the, their constituency dynamics, whether they are safe or marginal, and what effect does that have on how they vote. Um, do they still vote strategically? Do they still vote based on the party that they are closest to, either in terms of their identity or policy and so on? And so that was the main question that we were really interested in. Um, in terms of the debates, it was quite an interesting thing. Um, in 2010, we had three debates in the UK. And all three debates were decided, I think, about a month or six weeks before uh, the campaign began, or before the election day. Um, and it was very clear who was going to be part of it. It was the three main party leaders. Um, they would participate in three debates. They were going to be held on each broadcasting stage and one each on each broadcasting stage. And it was actually really, really clear. In 2015, um, it was all up in the air. They had, so, they had negotiations on who's going to participate, on the format, on who's going to broadcast these, on how many, it just went on and on and on. Uh, and as researchers who were trying to set up this project, we were tearing our hair out because we couldn't figure out what was going on. Uh, we knew why it was going on, uh, but we didn't know what was going to happen. And so it was, I think, maybe a couple of weeks before the campaign began that they decided on what they were going to do. Um, and they decided on four very different formats. Um, the first was going to be a one-on-one -on -one interview with a, a, a famous um, interviewer called Jeremy Paxton, who was one of those interviewers who kind of jumped down your throat every time you asked him. Um, very aggressive, and so that was going to be the first uh, format. 
and it, it would also go in, involve a, a kind of a town hall question and answer session with, with each of the leaders separately. The second format was going to be a seven-way leader debate. So there were going to be seven party leaders on stage at the same time. Um, and there would be questions from the audience that would be moderated by these, uh, by the moderator. So it's not going to be a free for free for all or a town hall kind of a setting. Um, the third one was going to be what is called the challenges debate. So the party leaders who are not part of government, because the uh, the previous government was coalition, and so you have two parties in the coalition, uh, and those two party leaders wouldn't be part of it, but everybody else would. Uh, and then the final format was going to be a question time kind of format, and this kind of follows. Um, the format of one of the uh, programs in the UK, where uh, people from uh, various parts of the political sector come together and discuss an issue. Um, and this would be the three major party leaders um, speaking to the audience, essentially. And so it was just all over the place. Um, there was no justification why we had all these different formats, and there was no justification on why certain party leaders were chosen and others weren't. It was quite confusing, uh, but in, in any case, we had to figure out what, what we would do, and we decided that we would try and continue the same process we did last time. And so, as Christy mentioned earlier, we had uh, our participants speak to us before each format. They would then watch the format, and then after that, they would speak to us on their impressions of how each of the party leaders did and, and uh, how did that affect the way that they thought they were going to vote and so on. Um, in terms of our overall findings about the debate, as you can imagine, there was a lot of confusion. Why were some party leaders chosen? Why weren't others? So, for example, none of the parties from Northern Ireland, which is a part of the United Kingdom, were chosen. There was no justification why that was the case. Um, why were only the parties who had a, a strong presence in the Indian continent? Why were they chosen? So, again, no, there was a lot of confusion about that. There was a confusion about the format. Why did you have different formats? Why were some party leaders um, speaking to us at one point but not at another point? Surely we want to hear from everyone um, and we want to hear their responses on all the questions. So there, again, there was confusion about that. Um, there was a lot of positive uh, response to the debate as well. Um, um, there were participants who felt that um, they or people they knew who didn't pay attention to politics. Um, they were not geeks like us, for example. Uh, but they found the debates uh, important because the debates were the time when they could sit in front of the television and get all the information that they wanted without having to crawl through party manifestos, without having to read, read, and read the newspaper articles, the journal articles, and that kind of thing. So, it was easy for people who were very busy, who didn't have time to pay attention all the time. So the debates were a one-stop shop to find out what's happening and to find out where the party stood. Um, they also felt that having these party leaders on the same platform at the same time gave people a sense of how they would be in office. So if people are put under pressure, how would they behave? Would they be calm and collected? Would they give you thoughtful answers or would they just blow their job? Um, would they just get flustered? So that kind of putting somebody under pressure, some of our participants felt that that was a good thing. Of course, then you had other participants saying that's not a measure of leadership at all. Leadership is much more than just reacting to pressure. It's about policy making and so on. So you have both of these opinions coming out uh, about the debates and, and their role in, um, in an election campaign. And then, of course, with Britain, and we found this in the 2010 uh, focus groups as well, there was this fear that British election campaigns are being Americanized. They are being presidentialized. We had these words coming out from our participants that um, Britain is not a presidential system. We vote for a party and not necessarily for a candidate. So why are we focusing on party leaders? We should be focusing on policy and not on party. Um, so those are the general impressions. I'll move it on to Christine and see if she has anything to add to this. Um, well, I do think that, yeah, the, the British system, too, is it's worth noting their elections are five weeks long. 
The only people who can spend money during that time are the political parties. There's no independent groups. There is no massive amount of radio time being bought up by seniors groups or environmental groups or business groups. There's uh, the television. It's regulated in terms of how much time a party gets for a party political broadcast based on the share of the vote that you got. And they're, they're broadcast it's sort of, you know, like they're like little four-minute commercials. Basically, you can watch them on YouTube if you're interested. If you've never seen one, just like Labor Party um, political broadcast 2010 or 2015, you can watch one. So in terms of the amount of noise that they're getting, it's very different from the American system. And the debates then, for a lot of people, do become a, a way to get a lot of that information at one time. And I think the other thing just to um, generally... The, the tone of discussions in politics, if you just have people in the room talking about politics, the natural default is that they're going to complain. And that might be just everywhere, but in the UK, complaining is a bit of a hobby. People like to have a good moan. And so uh, we also, because they, they, they said some things they liked about the debates, but they tended to focus on the negative, and so just to kind of push them on the issue, we would ask, okay, well, if you could wave a magic wand, and from now till the future, you won't, we won't have debates anymore. They'll just be off TV. Most people, like, I think basically 10% said, yes, I'd like that, but 90% for all their flaws and all the problems, they do not expect their leaders to stand up and defend their policies and manifestos. So I think that was maybe one point that Adia, I mean, her, 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 her answer was amazing and also very full, so I'm just thinking of like little bits. And then the other unique factor in this election was that we had three party leaders, uh, three parties led by women. So last time, we had the three same guys, Gordon Brown, uh, the Labour, Lib Dem, and Conservative Party leaders, at the same three debates. And this time, you had three women and four men in the seven-person seven person debate, and then three women and two men on the challengers debate. And Nicola Sturgeon, obviously, was one of the more powerful political leaders to emerge from this election cycle. And we were I was actually quite surprised at the lack of sexist comments or um, even even a hint of that kind of um, problem being brought up as part of the debate. So when we asked our participants, like, did you feel anyone was being sexist, um, or there was any problems with you know people's uh, attitudes toward the women on stage or the men on stage, and they're just like, no, like, that didn't even occur to me. And that I found very inspiring um, because if we can have this kind of debates and not bring sexism into it, you know, there is a role model for that being done where women and men can be on stage and just be very powerful spokespeople for the values that they're representing and not be judged in terms of whether or not they're in heels or, you know, um, flat man, men's shoes. So that would be, I think, about it in terms of the main main findings. Oh, you're still on mute. <laughs> yeah. That's okay. I must be new at this. We all have our moments. <laughs> Uh, it feels like, but um, I'm so excited to respond, and thank you for that. Um, I also saw in the video, really, the emphasis of how um, debates do, it seems, I agree, bring about democratic, uh, republic, whatever it may be, but just accountability. And, um, you know, that being said, um, it's the good thing, hey, they're doing the debates in Britain, right? They didn't do that before. So thumbs up to the people organizing the debates out there for actually doing it, but definitely the people are probably really yearning for it. Um, I agree the debates uh, do seem very controlled when there's a host, there isn't having interaction between um, the people and all. Social media is so key. You know, when we held the 2012 debate with Larry King, we had a couple people um, ask questions on social media. In the future, we want to be able to do that live and maybe from the crowd because um, that creates, um, you know, when it can be so scripted, as you mentioned, it can be a lot of the same answers. It's another thing you had in the video, back and forth, and people are like, uh, it's, it's, it kind of discourages them to see the, hear the same thing from one debate to another. So having that in the moment, it, it may ruffle a little bit of feathers, but really important to have more of a conversation than an argument. And it seems like a lot of debates, at least in the United States, the Commission on Presidential Debates, whew, I mean... In 2008, when I hung out and was the, end of, uh, the ballot access coordinator for independent presidential candidate, Ralph Nader, he's left-leaning. I don't believe in all of his uh, viewpoints, but I believe in broadening our electoral choices. And I would have done ballot access for Dr. Ron Paul had he ran third-party or independent as well, simultaneously. Um, but in any case, I remember going to the DNC with Ralph Nader, and I was the only one that had this press pass because the other two guys forgot theirs back at the office. I'm like, well, I'm going in there with Ralph 
just the two of us. So I had him to myself for like four or five hours. And I remember him looking at all the press, hundreds of them. And he goes, you know what, Christina? I could interview with every single one of these press, and I wouldn't reach 3 to 5% of what the Commission on Presidential Debates reaches. And this little bell, this little light went on in my head. I'm like, well, I'm wrapping up this ballot drive, getting them on the ballot with a great team organizing in 45 states plus D.C. We didn't have enough money for all 50. But historically, that is an uphill challenge, and we were able to prevail, starting at zero ballot lines for an independent. That's another uh, interview for sure. But um, I learned about the Commission on Presidential Debates in the United States, how it's run by the former chair of the Democratic and Republican Party, how the League of Women Voters has withdrew their support back in 1988, stating specifically that the Commission on Presidential Debates, CPD, has perpetuated a fraud a fraud on the American voter. And you can go onto your phone, you know, on our stage um, this fall, all through our presidential debate next next year, um, we're going to have information where you can go on Wikipage and see what the Commission on Presidential Debates does. Um, this, the Democratic Republicans have essentially, um, and the system have created this platform um, that uh, doesn't include others. And that lacks uh, transparency. Um, it's not good. And so how do we open the debates? Well, I thought the best way to do it is to create an open debate that truly does include more candidates. So in 2008, while our restrictions were inviting the candidates who were on the ballot in enough states to be viably electable, um, that's all I could handle, you know, moderating first time with well, actually Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Chris Hedges moderated that debate. It was aired on C-SPAN um, nationwide, which was pretty cool, C-SPAN too. And um, in any case, uh, I really realized after uh, that debate um, that in 2012 we would open it furthermore. We would allow every candidate um, that was on the ballot, uh, where they're viably electable, which I think is 30, 35 states, somewhere in there, 32, plus and or received 1% in the national poll. But still, I felt in 2012, there were over 30, I think 36 candidates who ran for president. Um, I really could only handle inviting, I think, six or seven. I mean, moderating more than six, seven, eight people is pretty challenging. I had always, and I do hope in the future, um, that we can open it furthermore and let the people decide online through accountable voting, social media, who will be in the first round of open debates, of live debates. If there's 100 people running for office, let them all have a chance to get in the first round of open debates. But these are just some ideas um, in the works. Uh, finally, the kind of format we use is the cumulative format. Um, it's worked for me. Um, and I, you can look that up. It's a little bit has the opening and closing statements. Um, you know, each candidate has X amount of time to answer X many questions. And then they have um, a rebuttal, which means typically, I think, depending on how many candidates there are and how much time we crunch per question, they can have up to maybe five rebuttals. They can use all of those on one question if they want. So it engages that interaction back and forth. And we really promote a conversation at our debates, not an argument. People don't want to walk away, like you mentioned in your video, after 90 minutes feeling, eh, you know, discouraged, an argument. Um, we want to really bring about those solutions and that sort of dialogue, and that's super important, it feels, in the debates. Finally, women, equality in office is definitely lacking in the United States of America, as it sounds like in Britain. And for that matter, we need to have also more ages, it feels like, more diversity. I mean, we are really one as a nation. And the system, and the party system, I know in Britain you guys are foreseeing people and the parties and their policies. I get that. But I'm about seeing the individual and what policies they stand for. Because I think that parties, um, you know, as we broaden our choices, we go back to the origins of the Constitution, no mention of parties. You see these candidates hiding behind party labels. Um, Washington once said most dreadful, you know, the parties are the most dreadful uh, thing. And, and um, you know, so for me, it's very um, obvious that with the power of Internet, social media, having a community, a force on the ground of just we the people, we will bring about transparency within our elections. And it's all, I mean, the cell phone is so powerful, this thing in your fingertips, like, 
we're going to be, you know, launching an election system app that will list every single candidate running for office. It doesn't matter if they're a DR, third party independent. People can see them as an individual. Imagine online congressional debates and movement rising. Um, we put out a release, James Gurick, who, thank you so much, James, for lighting up this interview. You rock. Um, and I know he's in the background, um, our editor, um, our writing editor and, and holds down the fort and, and uh, many other people in Free and Equal. But, um, you know, we're going to be launching this election system app that is going back to that, which will have incorporate all those online debates. But he, we recently put out a release stating that we need only 470 people to run for office. That's not many for the congressional races in 2016. So imagine a platform that brings in the debates, the election uh, symposiums on voting methods, alternative to festivals, all together in one expo that brings about these solutions because when the solutions rise in the U.S. of A, um, we're going to be working with intellectuals like you ladies that are probably going to be in Britain someday, well I will be, throughout the world, every country for that matter, meeting with fellow uh, comrades and leaders and um, angel warriors like yourself out there, so I can't wait till we have that uh, you know, cup of organic tea <laughs> together. So thank you for listening. I, a lot of this is coming from my passion, and I am so passionate about this topic. I, I mean, the debates are probably the most powerful tool the United States of America government uses to divide us, as well as mainstream media, to corruption in the music industry, you know, to Hollywood. I mean, there's all these different things, what we hear, what we see, and I see a movement, like, a positive energy, high vibrational levels of sound healing, of unity rising throughout the world very quickly. And so on that note, I just uh, really wanted to thank you so much um, for your work. But there's so many more questions, uh, you know, about really going into the elections here a little bit more. I don't understand the elections in Britain as much yet, which is why I have you experts on this line. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, the greatest differences between, um, you know, the, the, the electoral systems? For example, um, uh, the two electoral systems, that is, between the UK and the US. I'd love to hear more about that. And I'm sure yeah, I'll listen to yeah, I think we decided that was going to be mine because I was an American, so I come with that native having grown up in the country. Uh, so I <laughs> mentioned the last thing, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yes. Um, so in terms of um, one of the, the differences I mentioned already was the, the length of the campaign. So, of course, ours is starting now, uh, basically. Um, people are announcing now, and the election is going to be in November of 2016, whereas in the UK it's five weeks Parliament is dissolved, and then five weeks later, the election is held. We have a lot more elections in the U.S. So if you think about your average state with a bicameral legislature, you've got every other year a possibility to vote for, you know, maybe Congress, um, the, uh, the House, the Senate, the President, on the state level is the governor, the Senate, the Assembly. You might have a city council election, then there might be referendums. In the U.K., they, they basically have, you know, sort of the general election once every five years, and it's just one seat. So you get sort of one opportunity to vote to who represents you in the national parliament, and that's it. So oh, the weight, sure. <laughs> yes, and that's why I mean one of the reasons why the turnout rate is you know a higher 60s, and in the uh, Scot Scotland it was in the mid 70s, I think. Um, so because people obviously only vote uh, you know once every five years for parliament, there's no money. Well, there's money in the British elections. I don't want to say there's no money. But when you compare it to the kind of dark money super PAC system that you have in the U.S., it's very different. Again, independent expenditures are illegal there. Um, and then in terms of the system itself, the U.K., like the U.S., has a first-past-the-post or a winner-take-all. So if you have a plurality in a constituency, you win the whole constituency. There's no proportional representation. Uh, so, you know, Barack Obama will win an entire state. He won't win half of a state, but depending on the vote. Uh, so the U.K. also has that system which produces when the outcomes is stable majorities. Um, and it is a parliamentary system, so that there's the House of Commons, and that is the main democratic body that represents the electorate, elect, the electorate generally. But then there's an unelected House of Lords, which doesn't 
have an oversight role in the way of sort of like stopping legislation, but they can send things back for reconsideration or be a speed bump or talk about issues in a way that the people might not in the comments. Um, and I think that's those are really the biggest the biggest differences uh, between the two systems. So the time of the election, the role of money and advertising, and then also basically yeah, the, the individual power of, of you know, the MPs and the House of Commons. So. Well, um, I definitely, um, very interesting, every five years, of course, uh, the voter turnout is very low in the United States of America. Um, I think a lot of the reasoning is because we don't have the kind of candidates that get people excited, you know, to vote for, um, wrapped around candidates influenced by money and politics, Citizens United, not a good thing um, by any means. And um, also the fact that our electoral system is rigged in the United States of America. So interesting you go into the alternative voting methods. Um, that's great to have plurality voting. Um, we just have the singular vote, voting system here in the United States of America, which creates that you know false really wasted vote syndrome. So, so as soon as somebody rises a third party or independent, Oh, yeah, the media, as we know, um, um, run by whatever the Rupert Murdochs and so on. I mean, it just maybe don't have the, the best of intentions um, are really wrapped around making money, which um, um, all together, the government, the system, the people who control the people in office, the, the, you know, the, the, the puppet strings from the, the wealthy families, some say, the Rothschilds. I don't know. I don't like to point fingers. I mean, if they weren't there, if Rupert Murdoch wasn't there, Somebody else would replace them. It's the system that's broken. Um, that's the problem. There's no reason to put anger there. Let's just fix it. And the way we fix that is by um, creating a movement, a platform, that essentially replaces really a majority, if not every member of Congress. And um, with candidates that understand that alternative voting methods are a great thing, should we have approval voting or score voting or instant runoff voting, uh, proportional representation is uh, seemingly a, a resolution over 60 countries have, um, you know, to, uh, is the electoral college popular vote a good thing for the United States of America? I have never heard one person say that's a good thing for the United States of America. It's looking very promising that it's not. To the redistricting, to the gerrymandering, to the voting machines, you know, the closed source software, um, you know, so we're here to bring together those experts that will evolve in our um, alternative voting methods slash election integrity symposiums um, to discuss um, these sort of issues because I don't know what the solution is. What, what is the best way for us to vote? Well, I think that there is going to be a solution, but it's up to me and this movement and us to bring together those sort of leaders to have those sort of dialogues. So um, naturally, you know, in the United States of America, on um, a recent poll, the Gallup poll, stated over 42% of voters, 42% perceive themselves as independents, while only 25% Republican, and it's either 32, 33% Democratic. And that's significant. 42% of Americans consider themselves independent. So it really rings in my ears, you know, working with Ralph Nader, Ron Paul has endorsed us to Marianne Williamson, a celebrity New York Times bestselling author, recently ran as a woman empowerment for Congress in California's 33rd district. And, you know, due to the flaws of the electoral system, I feel personally a big reason she didn't get elected is because of the top two primary system, which is another huge flaw in our electoral system, briefly, where only the top two vote getters in the primary advance on the ballot in the general election. It could be just two Democrats, two Republicans. And essentially, it's a closed primary. It's like Louisiana-style politics. Um, you might as well call top two protect the incumbents act. It even squeezes the party leaders at the state level out of their party and really gives the federal even more power. So independent candidates that are prominent, like Marianne Williamson, really don't stand for a chance, even if they're endorsed by Deepak Chopra and have, she had Jason Mraz play at her fundraising parties and still couldn't make it past the primary. So, you know, there's a lot of these flaws that discourage, I feel, angel, fellow angel warriors like Marianne and many others from running over and over again. But, but our roles, at the very least, is to educate people, I feel, about these flaws. So, um, gosh, I'm looking forward to learning more in person after this about the parliamentary system, the House of Commons, the House of Lords. Um, of course, I'm familiar with the winner-take-all. Um, independent expenditures are illegal. 
stash money in politics is a big issue in the United States of America for sure. And the way we're going to, to again, uh, fix that is the internet, a platform, getting these people inspired to run for office. And so I'm excited. I think a lot of people um, in our network that are going to watch this interview are going to feel really empowered that and knowing that people like us out there care and really want them to run. So um, can keep, I could keep going on and on about this topic, but um, I guess I uh, wanted to really um, go into some other questions we have here. <sighs> Do you believe, like, I guess it's probably an obvious question, but um, choice is important in elections. You know, U.S. is dominated by the Republican and Democratic Party. They have full control of the debates, and so I'm just curious. Um, you kind of emphasized choice, but wanted to go a little bit more into um, why you might feel that more choice, and again, broadening our electoral choices, at least in the United States of America, is important. Well, maybe Eddie, I can speak to how people reacted to the first past the post system in the UK and the idea of a wasted vote and their options um, and and also the role of the debates in raising the profile of can, uh, candidates or party leaders that they hadn't seen. So. I would love that. The way, yes, please. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, um, so I think there's for me at least there were two um, two aspects related to choice that came out from the project. The first was about this idea of having a safe or a marginal constituent. So this question of the waste vote that you mentioned. Um, that people in our group um, also spoke about why um, they were quite emotional in some ways because there was in, in some of the groups we had people who had moved house and so they had moved constituencies and whereas previously they lived in the fifth constituency they had moved to another place which was a marginal constituency and we had people telling us I feel um, like my vote means something now whereas in the past I would just vote because, and I knew it didn't mean anything, and, but I still voted because I felt it was my duty to vote. But now I, I actually can do something. It, it affects um, the government, it affects the policy, it affects um, what happens next. And so they actually did feel empowered by living in a constituency where their vote would mean something. Um, and so in terms of choice, um, having a closed system where um, one party is so far ahead and nobody else, that nobody else has a chance, um, actually this empowers voters and we had voters speaking about that quite um, um, emotionally even, uh, how much it meant to them. So in that sense, the choice was important. But when we took it to the leaders' debate, we saw something slightly different because we had voters saying um, they didn't know who these people on stage were. Um, the debates were too, um, they didn't give them enough of a chance to get to know the leaders there. And um, because these leaders were often not portrayed in the media, they were not covered in the media or not enough, their policies were not covered in the media. And so um, voters who just put um, newspapers um, either online or printed newspapers or television, they didn't actually get to know these leaders very well. And, and in the debates, maybe these leaders got 15 minutes at the most to talk about their policies and so it was just um, a snapshot. Um, and so where, um, where, where the debates were important, they were not enough for all the leaders. The exception to this, of course, was the first surgeon of the SNP, which is the Scottish National Party. Um, and she came across really, really strong in all the debates, in two debates that she was a part of. Um, and in the short period of time that she was given in the debate, she could make a difference. She made an impression on voters across um, across the uh, across Britain. Uh, so it didn't matter which uh, party these voters um, supported. She left an impression on them, whether it was positive or negative. But she, but she was the exception to that group. The other two uh, party leaders who the voters were not familiar with, they kind of just faded in the background, despite participating in the debate. Um, and so where choice is important, uh, visibility is also important. So the debates are one way of getting that visibility, but I think from our focus groups we felt that these leaders and their policies should be cover, covered elsewhere, not just in the debate. So those are the two um, aspects related to choice that I think I wanted to highlight. 
Uh, lovely. You know, I definitely um, think that the debates are going to be a very exciting, if not the key component in 2016, that is going to inspire all people to really get not only engaged in our voting process, to vote, register to vote, um, to uh, potentially running for local office in the community. I foresee in the United States of America people being asked by their community to run for office rather than those who are seeking. That's the personality type that I feel um, will be attracted into our electoral system in the future and is super key. Um, as far as uh, you know, the debates, um, the voter turnout being so low and and this movement, you know, I once went to the Students for Liberty group, great organization, by the way, Students for Liberty. They probably have some chapters in Britain who have run by Alexander McCobin. They really reached that left-right paradigm, which I wanted to hit as well on this. Um, but I had this girl walk up to me after I spoke at Pepperdine University in California, and uh, she said, why do you do what you're doing? There's just no way you're going to be able to you know, achieve, you know, bringing about the accountability within our government. And she is a bright-eyed 20-year-old. I mean, imagine, you know, where we were at 18, 20, different world than now. And, and I looked at her and I said kindly, then why are you here? You know, why are you here today? Because the moment that we give up, I always say we become a part of the problem. And that is not an option. You know, the system wants us to give up. They want us to become apathetic. You know, and I go back to leaders like Winston Churchill who said, never, never, never give up. And I also go back to our keynote speaker, 1960 civil rights leader. Talk about an angel warrior, Amelia Boynton Robinson of Selma will be delivering a keynote address at the United We Stand Fest this fall. Um, we're announcing the venue and date. It might be somewhere around September 19th, but in any case, um, this upcoming week or so. And Amelia Poynton Robinson right there, she was the first African-American woman to run for Congress in Alabama in the early 60s, garnering 10% of the vote. In the 1920s, she was a little kid in a little buggy wagon. She's actually 109 years old, by the way. That's going to be publicized, not 103. She's, you know, not a youngin anymore, right? <laughs> and, you know, she was around in a buggy wagon with her mom, her mom registering her to vote. Um, she is just, she led the March of Selma, as you may recall, the recent movie Selma, um, which um, led into the March of Montgomery where Martin Luther King came in, Bloody Sunday, one day that changed America for 50 years. And, you know, as difficult and challenging at times it's been to run free and equal elections, I'll tell you, I have been pushed to the limits to try to be broken. It is not an option because my conscience is the destiny. It's my role as a creator uh, to build and organize this, 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 you know, free and equal elections for the people. And I am super humbled to have her speaking at our fest, um, you know, this fall. And uh, hoping that Kwaku Mandela, uh, considering Nelson Mandela's uh, grandson, um, gives her a Mandela Award uh, on the stage. And again, you know, I, I don't point any anger. Anger is not the solution. Uh, the solution is creating positive energy and, and focusing, well, on the solutions and uh, not the latter. So, um, you know, on that note, I'd love to maybe wrap up the interview. Um, you know what and how I feel about the, the qualitative election study of Britain. You can go to wintersresearch.wordpress.com. Just curious what you ladies, I have to ask, like what your feelings are um, towards the opinion of the work of free and equal elections. And, and then we can just have a closing statement of maybe two minutes each, <laughs> um, if you would like, uh, but would love to hear your feedback. Yeah, oh, I don't know if you want to go first, Edzie, and say a short thing, and then I'll say a short thing, just so that we both, yeah. <laughs> well, I, um, it certainly is very important that we have organizations like the Green Equal Foundation working towards um, increasing choice, uh, because where, uh, where is increasing choice is extremely important, and it's also about increasing the quality of information that's available to voters. And so without that, without that quality of information, choice is meaningless. So it's important to have um, meaningful choice, uh, you know. Um, and so I think that's probably the work that uh, your organization does and should be commended for that. Um, yeah. 
And I also think that it's important um, for even the, the, like, not only for the political party leaders to have democratic accountability to stand up in front of the voters and justify their policy decisions and try to explain why they think they're good for the job, but I also think for any commission, it should also be um, uh, accountable to the voters and not necessarily to the parties, because ultimately that's who they're doing the job for. It's the candidates um, that are out there. You know, yeah, there should be thresholds so that so that serious candidates aren't lost in people. Okay, in the UK they've got the monster raving loony party. The monster raving loony party is never going to be on the debate stage um, because it's not meant to be a serious party. So you know you can't put everyone on there. But for serious contenders, if you really want people to see what choices are out there, then television obviously is the most powerful medium for that. And you know it is the case that I think that the debates are public services. It's like a public service announcement. It should be something that all broadcasters have to provide free of charge as part of you know having their license and to allow that free and open debate and not let it be taken over by networks or political parties and trying to control it. So I think making keeping the commission accountable, making sure that that's open and transparent is also a part of it as well because if you don't understand who gets on stage because of the backroom deals, then you can't really have accountability in terms of what's really happening on stage. Well, great. You know, as far as serious contenders, um, that's why I hope with Free and Equal we can let the people decide even if there's that funny named party, um, for them it might be a serious thing. You never know. Um, probably not, well, who knows, benefit of the doubt, but let the people decide like who should be in the first round of debates. Um, as far as TV, gosh, I think like the next, the whatever, revolution, I like to drop the E and say evolution because <laughs> we have no need uh, for negativity. We have this thing called the internet and social media and the ability to spread the word beyond TVs is kind of um, TVs in at least the United States of America are becoming a bit archaic. I mean, people, again, are watching things on, on Snapchat, you know, all these things on their cell phone, quick to the point. It's, it's, this is our freedom. This right here is our freedom in the United States of America, the world. The whole world is watching. No pressure. I am ready to talk to the whole world at once, but really because I will be surrounded by, I feel, lovely individuals such as yourself and many others. You know, I'm just here to pave the way for, for that, you know, for people to be heard. Um, and gosh, just the fact that we're able to do this on Skype today is it, just... Um, a Three different countries. A beautiful, I know, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. Thanks for emphasizing on that. And, you know, really the goal beyond people say, well, what's your agenda? Because there's a lot of that doubt, you know, like... Uh, Free and equal, could that be real? I'm like, well, thank goodness I have a rap sheet of 15 years that's pretty consistent or 100 uh, consistent. Um, but, you know, really um, my agenda, or I like to say more so goal, you know, in a positive way, uh, is not only to bring about peace throughout the, the world and, um, you know, end the needless hunger that's derived by the system. Some things say intentionally, I mean, you follow the money, it's, it's, it's you know, not a good thing. But... You know, the fact that innovation and technology has been intentionally suppressed by our government, at least here in the United States of America, um, you see the pharmaceutical industry that feeds into the party system, giving them money. You look at gas, electric, the fact that over 5,000 patents on just free energy alone has been squashed by the U.S. government since the 1900s. I mean, the cures, you know, we, we focus so much on the cures, the system, but what is the cause of these problems? And I feel once and when we get the accountable people in office and people see how much money on this app is this person getting in their campaign? And, you know, if a pharmaceutical industry is giving them $200,000 or one of our sponsors, Dr. Bronner Soaps or Organic Marley Coffee, or Nature Pass Food Organic, or Rock the Vote, or whatever it may be, Headcount, um, you know, is, is giving to these candidates or endorsing them, musicians like Moby, um, or Michael Franti, um, or Knocko Bear, I mean, you know, and so on, um, uh, Peter Harper, are, you know, are, are supporting these candidates and, and performing at their actual, you know, get-togethers and all. People are going to see what, what person's there for me, uh, not for the money, and so accountability is right at our fingertips, not only for our electoral system, not only for the music industry, uh, not only for um, Hollywood and made to make media, 
but you know, also for technology and innovation as we roll into quantum physics and science, I mean, that is like super exciting stuff for me I can't wait to learn more about as well. So on that note, I want to thank you ladies so much for being on the show today. Did you have any final words for the wrap-up? I know you already had your two-minute closing statement, but it's not a debate. <laughs> it's a conversation here. Um, did you have any other things that you wanted to plug? And I think we're, we're, we're good for our first round. And I can't wait to have you on again to talk more in, in detail uh, about the system, um, uh, you know, the electoral of Britain, the United States of America, and how we can uh, bring about better ideas within the United States of America. I think that's going to be our next interview. <laughs> so, I guess for my final comments, I think the one thing that I've learned living in Europe is that there's a real value to having people who have different cultures very close by you. So, you know, I am a two and a half hour train ride to Amsterdam. I'm three hours by fast train to Paris. I'm, a, you know, an hour and a half flight to London. And, every, and that's not a very long way to go. And suddenly you're in another country with an another language, another way of doing things. And one of the problems I think we have in the U.S. is that it's just so big that there's not a lot of opportunity to see differences and see how maybe some other people do things worse, but sometimes they have better ideas. They, they're doing it in a better way. And so I would hope that with the free and equal movement, that you know, mental flexibility in terms of don't, doing, don't do something just because you've always done it that way. Maybe think about the quality of the product, you know, what it is that you really want to get out of this process, and then yeah, be open to looking at where other people are doing it maybe better and seeing whether or not that you can apply those ideas, maybe not the policies, but the ideas you know, locally. Mm, thank you so much for that. That's a great ending there. And uh, anything else? <laughs> um, no, I think Christy found it up beautifully. So yeah, I she really that. did. Well, ladies, thank you for your time, and uh, thanks to the Free and Equal National team. Um, you know, James, Tiffany, Matthew, you're all out there. Nick Burnaby, all of you guys, uh, you know who you are. Like, we wouldn't be where we are today without all of you um, making this organization a reality to our sponsors, to our supporters. And I'm just really humbled to, to be a part of something that I feel could really change America, not only for the next 50 years, but for many centuries or for the foreseeable future to come. Um, so thanks again uh, very much. Um, have a beautiful night, and I can't wait for our next interview. Um, you're joining the Free and Equal Network, and I hope you enjoyed our show. And until next time, lots of love to all of you.